On, uh, our, this is the second week of Advent, and it's on peace. And we, as we were just praying a little bit ago, we remember that Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, that as we surrender our lives to him, he will fill us, and he will give us the peace that we need. Um, and, and yet he will also, if there's sin, he will convict of sin. And uh, I think we've all probably felt that before. So uh, anyhow, we thank God for who he is and that we can come together and celebrate during this Christmas season the promise that was given of a Savior. So please stand with us this morning. This first song is called O Come Emmanuel, and it's a little bit different arrangement. I've used it in years past. But we remember as we consider the, this first stanza of words, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God will appear. And we look forward now not to that first coming, but to the second coming when the Son of God will again appear. So please sing with us.
Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for coming. Thank you for redeeming our souls. Thank you for paying for the wrath of God on the cross. Thank you for all of these things. And thank you especially that we have the freedom to come together this morning, as well as the responsibility to sing our praises to you, to worship at your throne, to give you the honor that is due you and you alone. King of kings and Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, almighty God, we worship you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fall fresh on us this morning, that you would show us exactly what you want us to know today, that we might leave this place later on this morning more like our Savior and be carrying that beautiful message out into this dark world. Oh, come, Emmanuel. In your name we pray. May be seated. Good morning. Good to see a lot of visitors here today. Always good to see. Uh, just make you aware of some announcements. They're, I think, pretty much all in your bulletin. There's a Christmas drama tonight. Starts at seven o'clock. I can encourage you to, to come to that. I'm sure it's going to be super. Uh, there's a Christmas coffee tomorrow, at two o'clock at Sherry Peterson's. Going to be an event? Yes, Sherry? Okay. Christmas coffee? Good? Okay. Uh, moving over, the angel tree that most of you are aware of, where we, we've got different people's names and we get them gifts and then we, we go caroling and uh, give those individuals those gifts. There's still several names on the tree, so if you feel led, why grab a name and get a gift? It, the tag tells you kind of what their needs are. Uh, missionary wives, we've been taking donations for that for several weeks, and uh, I believe they, they uh, received over $2,800, so that's tremendous to send to the wives. Uh, lastly, on your last page, there's several people there that, that you might keep in your prayers. Uh, See, Susan Gray is back with us this morning. And uh, Donna Winbolt has gotten home. She's still recovering from pneumonia. So continue to pray for those people. And uh, I believe that wraps it up. I'll turn it back to the worship committee, worship group. The spirit of Advent is expressed well in the parable of the bridesmaids who are anxiously awaiting the coming of the bridegroom, Matthew 25, 1 through 13. There is profound joy at the bridegroom's expected coming, and yet there is a warning. Be prepared. Last week, we lit the hope candle. Today, we light the second candle, which is traditionally referred to as the candle of peace. But it can also be known as the coming to execute justice candle, the shepherd candle, the Always be Prepare candle, the Bethlehem candle, and the Light of Peace candle. Regardless of the name, the purpose of this candle is to serve as a reminder, a reminder that at one time God's people waited for centuries for the new king who would deliver them from oppression. They were abused by power-hungry kings, led astray by self-centered prophets, and lulled into apathy by half-hearted religious leaders. But although they waited in prayer and longing for relief, were they really prepared when Christ finally came? Would we have been prepared if we had lived then? Do our lives today reflect our understanding that his promised second coming could be at any moment now? Are we any more prepared than God's people were over 2,000 years ago? Whenever we're on a mission with God, like Joseph and Mary were as they waited for the birth of Jesus, we have to prepare. No one plants seeds one day and expects a harvest in the morning. There are things to do. We are called to cultivate our lives. We all know the sense of peace that comes to us when we have satisfactorily finished the preparations to complete a project, no matter how large or small that project is. 
Do we recognize this to be true in our spiritual life? Advent should not be time filled only with hope and anticipation. It should also be a time of preparation. And that preparation should be marked by sincere and devout prayer. For us, prayers of true devotion, firm commitment, humble submission, and patience. And for those still walking in darkness, prayers of continual intercession. Preparation is a statement of faith. Only through great faith do we find peace. Advent is about keeping watch. When the bridegroom came, those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Watch, therefore, for you don't know the, the day or the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Advent is about eliminating distractions. Don't allow the stress of Christmas season to distract you from what is all really important. Simplify your life. Be still and listen to God's voice, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Advent is about noticing God's hand. Reflect on this past year. Perhaps you, like many, have faced financial difficulty, or maybe you've escaped danger or disease through an unforeseen miracle. Perhaps this year has been a time of suffering uh, or relation ship disasters. How has God carried you through all these things? Remember the words of Joseph in the Old Testament. You planned evil against me, God planned it for good. Genesis 50, 20. Advent is about discerning God's will. Ask God to give you direction. Only through living each day in God's will can we find peace. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps, Proverbs 16, 9. Let's pray. Lord, you know our lives are constantly full of preparation, planning for this, planning for that. But how much time do we spend searching for and discovering your will for us? As we prepare to celebrate Christmas this year, and as we continue on into the new year and forward into the rest of our lives, help us to keep our hearts and our minds focused where they belong, on you, and on the plans you have for each of us. In your name, amen.
Well, it is your time once again. Would you please stand with us again?
think it was last week, maybe the week before, but um, the, the church has uh, made these available and they're out in the foyer. They're a nice devotion through uh, this Christmas time. So if you didn't get one, I'd like to invite you to pick up one. One of the readings this week, I wanted to read just part of it. Look at the big picture because it's a worship service. Look at the nativity and you see a worship service. Angels hover over it like drones. Common, smelly shepherds and sophisticated wise men together bow down. Worship flows from everyone toward the child. It's difficult to imagine any greater contrast than what we see at the nativity. They are different socially. Shepherds were low on the social economic level. Wise men were so acceptable that they entered the king's palace. They were different educationally. Shepherds had no formal education, while wise men were famed for their knowledge. God is telling us that no matter who you are or where you are from, any and all can come to Christ and worship him. Christmas, first and foremost, is about worship. Those at the manger were not simply there admiring this child. They were worshiping him. Make sure worship is first on our Christmas list. This last song is called Adore, and that's what it's about, adoring our Lord.
Lord, just as people came to adore you as you came to this earth and to bring you gifts, Lord, we come to adore. We offer ourselves because you deserve no less than all of us. And Lord, we're mindful of the many good things that you have given us. And so at this time, we also bring our gifts to you. That your name would be proclaimed even louder, even further. That in some way, this offering would accomplish the, your will, Lord, your perfect will. And what we all look forward to, the return of Jesus. So receive our offering now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This morning, we are um, blessed to have a, re a, a representative from Gideon's International with us this morning, uh, who will tell us a little bit about the ministry of Gideon's. So uh, this is a fellow that a lot of us know very well, and this is Kylan. And uh, so Kylan, come on up. And if you would share a little bit about what's been going on and, and what Gideon's are uh, all about. Good morning, everyone. I have to tell you, our church in Omaha is a little bit bigger than this. On any given Sunday, we might have anywhere from six to 800 people. And this morning, we had the opportunity to meet with Gary. Where's Gary? I don't know where Gary's at, over there. Hey, 
we had to meet in Gary's classroom this morning, and there was only like five of us around the table. And it dawned on me, the power of a small group. You know what I mean? The power of a small group. And it's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about this morning is where that power comes from. And the conversations that we had in Sunday school this morning were just amazingly in line with what I wanted to share with you guys in terms of the Gideons. And a lot of times we'll get up here and we'll talk about the Gideons and how broad we are. You guys know it's a big organization, right? We all over the world. You go into a hotel room, there's a Bible, right? It comes from the Gideons. So we're not going to talk about all the numbers and anything like that, but I wanted to share with you a little bit about the why, the why behind the Gideons and the why behind what we do with the scriptures and why we do what we do with scriptures and giving it out to the world. And here a while back, I, I had the opportunity to read a testimony of a, of a young man from Arizona, Christos Terzan. Kind of reminds me of Tarzan. I always wondered what this guy looked like, you know. But he, this guy was, he grew up on the streets, grew up with a distant father, didn't have a family to speak of, so he found his family in the gangs, got connected with drugs and all the stuff that goes with that. Well, the amazing thing was, as you can expect, he ends up in prison, but he gets into an addiction recovery program in prison where he's introduced to people who are studying the scriptures. And what really annoyed this guy is the fact that they're all excited and happy. They're in prison, and they're all excited and happy, and it just irritated him. So he asked for one of those Bibles that they were using. So they brought him one of those Bibles, and he began to read it, and this, is what, this was his statement. He says, I just want to know, how does this book know me? How is it possible that this book knows me? That was his words. A man who had never had a family, and he's reading a book. I mean, I, I think about it, a book. And he asks the question, how do these words know me? I think that's a question that we should all ask when we're in the Word. And so I, I begin to think about this a little bit more and to ask the question, how is it that that book knows me? And I took that question a little bit farther, and I said, who is it that knows me? And begin to think into the scriptures a little bit about the why we need to hand out the Bibles and why we need to continue to do this more and more and more every day. Have you noticed in our country there's maybe a lack of leadership? Huh? Yeah? Do you know where we're going to find some of the greatest examples of leadership? Are in the scriptures, aren't they? the master leader himself, the master educator. And as, we were th as I was thinking through this, I said, what is the core purpose of the Gideons? The core purpose of the Gideon is to hand out the word of God, literally to give it away. We even have an app now, so it's easier to give it away. If you want to meet me after church, I'll show you, I'll, I'll let you listen to our app and we figured out what God sounds like. <laughs> yeah, meet me after church, and I'll, I'll let you know exactly how he sounds when he talks. So the purpose is to get the Word of God into people's hands. Why? Because the author is the greatest communicator the world has ever known. Its author is the greatest communicator and connector the world has ever known. This book... The Word of God, it can't help but be alive because its author, can't, it, it, its author knows nothing else but life. Do you realize that? The author knows nothing else but life. So I, I opened up and I went to the Sermon on the Mount. And if uh, some of you guys follow me on Facebook, I know. And I, and I put a question out on Facebook yesterday. And the question is, is it possible for Jesus Christ to be able to have and share an opinion? Is it possible for Jesus Christ to be able to have and share an opinion? And I haven't answered back on any of that, but I got to thinking about it. In the, in the Sermon on the Mount, 
Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If I was to walk up to you and sell you those things, you would see that as my opinion. But when Jesus Christ speaks it, it's no longer opinion, is it? It's no longer opinion. It's the power of Jesus Christ in why we hand out the scriptures and why we hand out the word of God. It says in here, it says, you are the light of the world. A city set set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As we think into the words of the scripture and the purpose behind handing out the word of God, I have to ask myself, when I'm doing that, do people see the light in me? Do people see the light in me? Do they, are they able to see Christ come through me just when I hand them the scriptures? Because, see, if they ask me a lot of questions about my opinions and different things, I can say the same words that Jesus does, but it doesn't come across the same way. And just like Christos had to read the scriptures, for, in order for him to know, in order for him to realize that that book knew him, he had to read it. He had to get into it. And, and that's what I wanted to share with you guys today. The Gideon organization is, it's not about the numbers. It's not about the number of countries that we're in. It's about the purpose in taking a small Bible and handing it out to elementary age kids in the schools. It's about being able to go to a college and give a college student a Bible because they don't know where to go with their life and they don't know which direction to turn. It's about giving someone that opportunity to speak with nothing but life. Jesus Christ is life. And they get the opportunity to have that personal connection with the author of life. And that has been heavy on my heart in the last few months. So I just wanted to share that with you today. If you want to be a part of this organization and help in the sharing of the gospel, there is so many different ways that you can do that. But first, I, I want to thank Tim, Tim and the church and the whole church board. I want to thank you guys for letting us be a part of this and to be able to take a few minutes and share with you. If you want to go be more involved with this, there's actually three things you can do. Number one, if you want to give to this, organization. Gary's going to be in the back, but I'm going to ask you to pray about that. There's a lot of things this time of year that you can give your funds to. If God's laying this on your heart to give to this, please do it. If God's laying on your heart to give some other way this Christmas season to get the word of God into the hands of people, then give there. But give where God is leading you. That's the most important thing. Secondly, continue to pray for the organizations like the Gideons and others. There's a lot of doors being closed to Christianity right now. There's a lot of doors being closed to the preaching of the gospel. So pray that those doors remain open and pray that maybe good Christian men will find crowbars and pry a few open. Okay? And then, of course, if you want to become a part of the organization, you, when, you can talk with Gary at the end. Gary would be more than happy to walk through what it means to become a Gideon and have the opportunity to just share and distribute Bibles with others. All right? Thank you very much. Kylie, can we have a quick prayer? Yeah. Lord, thank you for the, uh, the, the dedication of these men, and it comes because of what you are doing in them and through them. Lord, we know that your promise is your word will not return to you void, but will accomplish your purpose. And uh, we're all part of that, whether we belong to Gideons or uh, we're uh, faithful Christians that are speaking the word that you've given us. How grateful we are that you have given us the word. How important that word is. It is you. It is life. So, Lord, may we uh, continue to hold that word up high and continue to remember those that uh, are willing to go out on the streets and meet with people who do not yet know you. We pray a blessing on this ministry in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks, Kylan. And now if you would take your Bibles and turn to today's scripture reading as Monty comes up. It's found in the, uh, the book of Luke. This morning's scripture reading can be found on page 857 of the Burgundy Bibles or page 1019 of the Black Mountain Bibles. And it is Luke chapter 2, verses 25 through 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And we'll pray for the message. Dear Lord, just thank you for each of those that you brought here today, and uh, pray for those uh, who could not make it this morning, and pray for Pastor Tim as he brings a message this morning, uh, that we will continue to learn more about you um, in this Christmas season. In your name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's time for Children's Church. Thanks for hanging in there, kids. Good morning. Boy, it's good to be with you this morning, and uh, loved having the Gideon share this morning. The music was awesome. Uh, I, I, I trust you are blessed. And, and this morning, we're just going to dive right in. Uh, this, this passage, I, I pay particular close attention to this one particular verse that Monty just read. And, and that is in Luke 2.29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. That's awesome. And, and I, I pray that God speaks to you today. You know, as we're talking about peace, you know, in a world that is unraveling at an alarming pace, as an old senior pastor of mine used to say many times. You know, and I was reading some different things this week, and one in particular is about those that are persecuted in the church. I don't know if you realize this, more Christians have been killed in the last century than in the previous 19 combined. Let me say that again. More Christians have been killed in the last century, the 20th century, than in the previous 19 combined. And just how, how that kind of brings home a little bit about the unsettledness of our culture. Last Tuesday when we gathered for the, the Todd Becker Foundation speech or the presentation at the uh, afternoon with the, the, the assembly at the high school, we were immediately met telling us that there had been a lot of problems. In fact, the night before that there was a group trying to close it down. In fact, they met him and said, you need to leave. You just need to leave. The superintendent said, we don't know, but uh, there's been someone threatening a lawsuit and saying this can't happen. It broke a bow. You really, you know, I want to say, really? You know broke a bow? But it's here. It's right upon us. The attacks are coming. And, And before we dive into this, but I want you to think about, you know, that, that we live in this unsettled time is not that exactly much different than the time and the birth of Jesus and what was going on and what was happening. You know, let, let me begin to kind of set, unfold this little picture of Simeon and, and, and uh, you know, standing on the temple steps and standing where we believe that, that Simeon would have been standing and blessing the Lord Jesus kind of blew me away. I remember it was on that Sunday morning, and I think I texted some people back at church and said, I'm standing right where Simeon would have been holding the the baby Jesus and blessing him and saying, I have peace. Well, let let me kind of start unfolding this. If you go to your bulletin, the first point is peace among those whom he has pleased, is what the angels had said. Glory to God on the highest. It's in Luke 2.14. Glory to God on the highest on earth, peace among those with whom he has pleased. I don't know if you've ever pondered this, but have you really considered the first Christmas? How unsettling it actually was. 
You know, suddenly the, these poor shepherds are out doing their job and suddenly the, the angels are upon them telling them that, hey, there's peace here. And they were anything but peaceful at that moment. They were probably shaking in their, their sandals. What, how do we handle this? You know, and, and, and going a little bit further than on the Christmas Day story, if you really start to unfold this story and look at what's happening... And it came to pass in those days that they went out, to, uh, out of a, a decree from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be taxed. I, you know, I've been in Bow now over two years and I understand, or starting to understand, the difficulty about tax and taxes. I, I, I'm starting to get it, farmers. I'm starting to understand it, ranchers. And, and, you know, think about this. This is how it began. You're going, you're having to go to find out how much your tax is. That's why you're going. Mary, a, a young woman here, a first approaching the time that when she was going to give birth to her first child. I, I love how Martin Luther described this. She was a young lady, we, we don't know, 14, 15 years old, bringing forth her first child, you know, you know, she probably had, you know, the thinking, as, as Luther said, well, probably most likely the baby was going to be born in Bethlehem and going to be with my mom and, and all these kinds of things, but no. You're going to get on a donkey and go about 80 miles because of taxation. Boy, that's a joy. A lot of peace in that. It was an edict from Augustus that you have to go. You know, all this chaos was anything but peaceful was anything but peaceful. And, and that they, you know, but we must not attend merely to these events themselves, but we must remember that also this was God's hand moving them. And, and it was actually to fulfill prophecy in Micah 5.2 that it was, the child would be born in Bethlehem. And they wander from this design in their own mind, most likely that they were going to have this child there, but unconscious of where they were even going, they did not have reservations. They didn't get on the cell phone and say, this is where we're going to be staying. They went. And then they went, and they had to pay this tax. And it was a tax that most likely that what they were paying was what they had prepared to give to the temple. And so they were forced into going into this situation. They had no place that they were staying or anything, and it was anything but peaceful. <clears throat> to fulfill the prophecy exactly the way God intended it to be. This child would be born in a stable, no place for him to stay. I, I hope you kind of just stop and ponder this a minute. The angel said, peace to you. But this was anything but peaceful in the circumstances. And suddenly there was the angels, they speak glory to God in the highest and the thanksgiving and praises to God and, and that the peace has come to this earth. The earth is at peace. Listen carefully. The earth is at peace when men have been reconciled to God and enjoy an inward tranquility of their own minds and their understanding. This is really the picture of that we see the peace that they were bringing. And it's tended to inform us that this is when we trust to the grace of Jesus Christ, this is the peace. And, and no troubles that can arise will prevent us from enjoying composure and serenity in mind and heart when we have this peace. And remember, faith is based and seated amidst the storms of temptations, amidst various dangers, amidst violent attacks, amidst fears that our faith may not fail or be shaken of any kind of opposition. This is the picture. This is what it was about. And, and I, I pray that, that over the next few minutes, unfolding what this peace is really about. It was anything but peaceful, but the message was peace. And here it comes. Following, if you're following on the bulletin, the next point is peace was according to the Word. Peace according to the Word in Luke 2.29. Lord, now You are letting Your servant depart in peace according to Your Word. Let me just kind of unfold this story of Simeon for just a moment. That, that Simeon's circumstances were most likely anything but peaceful, especially after what he 
did. What we know, you know, you'll see some controversy in terms of who actually Simeon was. If you read any, any Matthew Henry, Matthew Henry talks about him as, as being uh, one of the, on the Sanhedrin, one that was on the, a leadership role within the Jewish council. Some even uh, tie him uh, or attach him to Gamaliel's father. We don't know. We do know this. He was a Jew. And, and he was standing on the steps. And, and, and he was standing there, and it, he was led by the Holy Spirit to stand there and, and to, to anoint this child, to know that he had seen the Savior. And, and, and this, is, this is the truth of what, you know, what we absolutely know about Simeon. He was a Jew. And if you understand Jews, they are still looking for Yeshua, the Savior. But when I was in Jerusalem, we heard this numerous times, no Yeshua. In fact, we in a couple of places, do not bring that name up. But when he said, he, Simeon stood on the steps and said, I have seen the Messiah. I have seen salvation. As a Jew, this meant he had troubles. Because if he had peace, he doesn't have it now in his circumstances because it is very unsettling for him. Because he is a Jew that is standing on the steps and saying, I have seen the peace. The Lord Jesus Christ, I have held him. And I praise you, God, for that. Second thing that really would have unsettled this for, for Simeon would have been this. He said the Gentiles are included. He said the Gentiles are now part of this. Before it was ever really thought of, he prophesied that the, the Gentiles would be included, and that means us. Every one of you, whether you realize it or not, are a Gentile. He just included you. Have you noticed something that, that you see this over and over in Scripture? His word that when you see the men of God who step out, knowing the peace have just made their circumstances unsettled and the absence of peace. This is the picture. But it was a peace according to the word that Simeon was hanging on to. It was a peace that he knew that the word had shown him through the Holy Spirit and the word that he understood from the Old Testament that this is the Messiah. And he stood according to God's word. This is the peace. Now, this leads us to this question, and look at his, if you look at his word and, and, and you understand this, we are taking him at his word, what does it say about peace? Well, finding peace when circumstances are overwhelming is the reality for most Christians. It is understanding that we are going to find peace in him, even though our circumstances may be anything but peaceful. And, and this is the picture that Jesus told us. In some of the most intimate words in Scripture, we see this. Is this in John 14, 27, peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. Not as the word gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. If you see this passage, I want you to look very carefully at the words. Let. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. When you see that word let in the New Testament, most of the time what that word is associated with is choice. Jesus is telling us that because if you choose him, in fact that's what he tells you in 14.1, choose him, let not your hearts be troubled. Is it this choice that I have a choice to focus on him or I have a choice to focus on my circumstances? That's the picture. Let me define you the two different pieces. The peace that the world talks about. You know how the world talks about peace? It's, it's like you've got to be cool. You've got you to have all this success. You've got to have all the answers. You've got you to look smooth. And, and it's got to feel right. It, it, and, and also it's based upon, does it fit my picture? Am I getting what I want? That's really the picture of the world's peace. But peace I leave you, Jesus is saying this, it's internal. It's intra. It's inside. It's not based upon what I want or what I get. It's based upon Him. 
the significance of salvation. You notice what Simeon said was, I have seen the salvation of the Lord. You've seen it. And Simeon was standing on the steps, not that his life was in peace, but his heart was at peace with Christ. That's the picture. That's the difference. So this is what Jesus is speaking about. I've told you about my speeding ticket. Have I ever told you that story? I can't recall some of the stories. Well, yeah, I, am, I confess. And some of you make fun of my driving already. I heard a couple people saying, we can always tell when Peterson's here, it's a cloud of dust coming into the driveway. And then you see this little body jump out of the car and run in the, house, the church. Well, I, I, I know I, I've, had, I've had my first speeding ticket, and, and uh, I'm an old correctional officer, so, you know, I, I kind of think of all these things sometimes. And, and, and I was anything but peaceful. My wife can attest to this. I got a speeding ticket in, in uh, Adams County. I still think it's a speed trap, but anyway, I got a speeding ticket. <laughs> Excuses, right? So peace, right? And, and I got this ticket, and I thought, okay. Uh, and I, I was so frustrated mostly at myself, and I got home, and I told my wife about it, and I threw it in the drawer where we keep our stuff. You know, don't, doesn't everybody have one of those drawers? You can't find anything in it, but you always stuff it in there, right? Well, I was supposed to, to respond to this within about 30 days. On the 31st day, I remembered. Have you ever had a moment like this? Oh, my. <laughs> I, I, I was like, uh, Sherry can attest to this. My face must have went... The blood flowed out of it. And my mind went nuts. Have you ever had a moment like this? That your mind goes crazy. I, I mean, I'm an old correction officer. I had myself in an orange jumpsuit and white shoes so fast. <laughs> and I was thinking, I'm probably going to know people. You know, and, and, and then I was, my mind was racing. I didn't sleep that night. I was, it was nuts. Uh, and I, I thought, oh, I have got to get there and pay this thing. And, I, and we lived in Kearney, and I raced. Oh, I didn't race. Um, <laughs> but I, I got there. <laughs> and I, and I, I get to Adams County Courthouse, sitting on the steps, waiting for this poor woman to come open the door because I was so anxious about it. And, and I, I think she was going to call security because she kind of walked by me like, yeah, I'm here. And, and, and she goes in and is, what are you here for? I go, i got to pay a ticket. And she's looking at me like, man, what is wrong with you, dude? You are out of your mind. And, and I, I paid the ticket, and she goes, oh, my. We didn't even, she had to go dig it up, and it was one of, in one of their boxes. <laughs> but i got to tell you about something. about when, when we have let our circumstances overwhelm us, where's the peace? What's it based on? It's based upon everything around here, none of it of which I can control. And, and, and we obsess about it. And, and you know, one of the things, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, when, when you are not at peace, you're like a porcupine. No, I'm serious. I, my wife tried to console me, and I was like a porcupine. Ever tried to hug a porcupine? Don't. It's not a good experience. But when you are unsettled like this, this is what that anxiety does from the inside. It absolutely rips you apart. And I would imagine there might even be somebody here sitting today going, the peace, yeah, right. Where? Where is it? Because our minds are so focused on it. And I would imagine probably everyone in this room could understand that. But if you're going to understand peace, I pray you listen very carefully. Next on your, your outline is applying discernment to peace. Applying the discernment. Discernment is that uh, it's a power that is given to us because we have the Holy Spirit if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That a discernment that I can look at this is this is good and this is not good. That, that's what this is, this discernment. And, and you notice in Colossians 3.15, and let, here's that word choice again, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. We'll deal with the thankful in just a moment. The word let is key, that am I choosing to let Jesus rule, or are you ruling? 
Am I choosing to look at my situation through Jesus' eyes or am I looking at it through my own? Which is it? Because this peace requires something from me that I am following Jesus Christ. That I'm discerning what He is doing and His leading and His Word exactly what Simeon did on the steps. I see Your Word and I have Your peace. Not that the circumstances are are, 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 are peaceful, but the peace is Him. See, the question is, is Jesus ruling your heart? Is my peace set on Him? Not me. Not my circumstances. And we're called to this, are we not? In other words, we're created to be in this peace, be settled in it. See, Jesus is our peace, therefore we are in peace. When you are not in peace, you are in my way, my hope, my direction. And I want you to notice something very careful that the Word requires of us is that we are to ponder upon the truth of God's Word. And and I want you to see something. I pray you follow with me. In John chapter 20, I want you to see this very carefully. In John chapter 20, just turn there with me. I love what Kylan said about the Word. And uh, uh, for those of you who might be visiting, that what we we believe here is the Word of God is truth. And I I pray that you walk away every, every time you're here is the focus on the Word. In John chapter 20, starting verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. So she ran to Peter and to John. And then I love this. John outruns Peter. Get better Nikes. And they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and and we've done, we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 3, Now Peter went in, <clears throat> out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now look at this carefully. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there. In your Bibles, I don't know if you highlight, I would hi- ask you to just think about the word he saw. He saw. So John beats Peter. And he runs, doesn't go in, looks in, and he saw that the linen clothes were lying there. The word, see, in in Greek sometimes, you'll see a more definition of what it actually means. So John visibly just saw it and went on. Just what his eyes took in. Now, but I want you to look a little further. Verse 7, And the face of the cloth had not been on Jesus' head. Now, verse, Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and it says, He saw. Different words. Because the Greek here, what Martin Lloyd-Jones and what James Montgomery Boyce bring out of the, the old Greek language here is this is there's a different word to mean to see and ponder. Think about it. You know, so many people miss the peace of Jesus because we're going so fast. We don't stop. Peter stopped. And he pondered it. And he thought about it. Look at what it says. He thought about it. He he saw the, the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head. Not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. And now he saw the pondering kind of looking and believed. This is exactly the verbiage that is described as Simeon standing on the steps. I have seen I have pondered it. I have thought about it. And they knew the peace. You want the peace? 
You've got to come to this. And, and, and it takes some time with him to really ponder it and understand who he is. And when you see this peace, it comes over you on the inside and gives you the strength to stand up to whatever the circumstances are. This is what the peace of God is about. This is what the peace has come. And I'll look a little, even a little further. If you go continue on, I, oh, I've got to rush. Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 7. Peace requires dependence. It requires dependence. Do not be anxious about anything. You know why? You know why it says do not be anxious? Because when you get anxious, it's got you. You can't think. You're like me, an orange jumpsuit and white shoes. It takes over. And you can't see the peace of who He is. Do not be anxious because if you let it get you, you can't see it. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's who it is. He guards it. I can't. In fact, I can't even know my own heart. Next point on your bulletin is peace requires relationship. It requires relationship. Peace requires a relationship with Him. And, and, and it's, it's so clearly said to us here. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, He is our peace. You want peace? You want the peace that's talked about in the Scripture? It requires a relationship with Him. No excuses. But here's the deal. Everyone is welcome. Everyone is welcome. For He Himself is our peace. Last on your bulletin. Because I want you to see this. Is that gratefulness is the porthole to peace and love. Gratefulness is the porthole to peace and love. Paul describes it this way. In Colossians chapter 3, 15 through 17. And let the peace of Christ rule. We talked about that earlier. To which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. You know, it is, I've said this before, physiologically impossible in our bodies to be anxious and grateful at the same time. I, I, I'll tell this story again. I, I've uh, used to do bio and neurofeedback. It's really nothing more than you take a measure of, of blood pressure and those kinds of things. I had this mother hooked up to uh, all the stuff and all the electrical things, her breath rate, her temperature, her fingertips, her BVP, all this kind of stuff that measures the body's peace or the absence of peace. And, and her five-year-old boy is hooked up to the same stuff, and, I, and I'm talking to them about what they're grateful about and prayer and the Word and all this kind of stuff, and all the levels come down, and their breath rate is nice, and their hand temperatures are nice and warm and, and, and nice and comfortable and peaceful. And I said to this mother, I said, now, without saying a word, would you please consider your checkbook? Without saying a word within moments, the GSRs, the galvanic skin responses, started to light up. Anxiety was coming on her body. And her hand temperature started to fall because less circulation and more stress causes less circulation in the blood flow. And then the heart rate went up and the breath rate went up. And you know what happened within just a few seconds? Her son matched it without ever saying a word. You know, this gratefulness. I have been reminded so many times in my own life, no matter my circumstances, have I stopped and counted the blessings that God has poured into my life. And you know what happens? I start to see Him. I start to see His peace. It goes on to the next passage. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, with thanksgiving in your heart. 
And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You want this peace? Step into the gratefulness. And praise God for those things that He's put in you. Peace is found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Through a growing relationship with Him. The peace is found when I'm dependent on Him and not on my circumstances. Dependent on Him is, is about surrendering to Him and His truth and His Word. And peace as I pursue it in Him is revealed more and more. And through the gratefulness, when we're grateful to God for His glory, for who He is, we see more and more of it. I want to leave you with this story as the worship team comes to close us. I'm reminded of this story. Oh, Father Martin used to tell this story. And it was about a POW in the Korean War. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever studied about the Korean War and, and how they were locked up. In and, and his cell, he was a captain in the Air Force. And, and he was locked up in a cell. And, and this cell was about six foot wide. And about six foot, you know, it was just a box. Barely six foot cube. And this man was about six foot five. There was absolutely no place that he could stretch out. And it was a cube, and he was in isolation. He could hear sounds of Korean words, but he could never hear the English. And he was isolated. He was beaten many times. And he, he, was, he was believing that he would never find or never see U.S. soil again. And he remembered some of these passages about peace. That Jesus, He is peace. And grateful. And in some of his writings, he talks about this. He said, you know how good God is to me? <laughs> what? On, on a day, I think it was close to Christmas because he tried to keep track of the days. And he said, you know how good God is to me? He let a rat, female rat, come into his cell and have her babies. And I shared my little bowl of rice and whatever it was, and I shared it with that rat. And you know how good God is? That he let that rat stay with me. I had company. Your circumstances tough? Yeah, they are. But I pray that you walk away today challenged to ponder upon the revelation of our salvation through Jesus Christ. And that we understand He is our peace and it is in that relationship. No matter what my circumstances are, His peace rules. Father, I praise Your name for this truth. And I thank You for uh, how You shown us over and over to ponder the truth and know it. As you recorded, Simeon's, that it, today I've seen the Savior. I can depart in peace. Over and over and over, you've shown us through your, your, your men that you've written the word about and through that it is your peace that rules. Lord, I, I know there's a lot of hurt and a lot of unsettledness in this group. Lord, I pray that you move in their hearts to slow down and just ponder the truth of who you are. Pick up the word and just to settle in it. Lord, I pray these things now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, please stand with us. We're going to sing verse 1 and 4 of It Came Upon the Midnight Clear.
Lord, we just pray that uh, these words that we sing here, um, that that would be our message. That uh, as a world, as a, the part of the world that uh, knows you and walks with you, Lord, that we would declare that there is peace in you. And it is only in you. So may that be our message, not only through this Christmas time, but always as you leave us on this earth. There is peace in Jesus because of who you are and what you have done. So now, Lord, help us to take this message out. In your name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.